right, so today, so today we're going to do one last, we're going to do a, a example of this connection between holography and conformal field theory and the light cone limit. Uh, and then I'm going to do some quantum information, tying this to some of the things that Marina has been talking about, and uh, then we'll wrap up. So the first thing I want to do Is it not on? Maybe the volume? Ah, okay. Microphone. Is that better? Check, check. Can you get Test, Testing, testing. No? Ah, it's not better. I think, I think I turned it on, but let's see. It's on. Okay. Is it, oh, now it's working. Higher up? Okay, how's that? Okay. So I want to re-derive the light cone OPE directly from holography. So we've gotten the ANIC two different ways, one from the light cone OPE and one by studying the propagation of signals through anti desitter and uh, the idea now is to explain why those two things had to agree and exactly what the relationship is. So consider an operator psi with a large dimension. This is just to make things a little simpler and isn't really necessary. This corresponds in ADS-CFT to a particle, so this, this heavy operator uh, is dual to a particle with a large mass. I should say that by large, I don't mean, the, I don't mean very large. Uh, there, there's a hierarchy of scales here when we're doing ADS-CFT, um, and it's, it's still much less than n squared, which is related to, the, to Newton's constant in the bulk. So the idea is to look at a particle uh, that propagates through ADS uh, in such a way that it's heavy enough to act like a particle, not a wave. So it's heavy enough to travel on geodesics, uh, but light enough that it doesn't really back react on the geometry. So if we want to calculate in some state of the CFT dual to some geometry, if we want to calculate the correlation function psi psi, then uh, in this limit of a probe part, of a heavy probe particle, you can calculate to leading order, you can calculate that two point function, the WKB approximation. or geometric optics, uh, which is just to say that the two-point function is calculated as the length of some geodesic. Geodesic lengths in the bulk are related to correlators on the boundary. L gamma is the length of the geodesic connecting these two points. So I'm going to put the two points uh, just like I always have been on the U 
the plane, uh, I'm going to put one point here and one point here. And then the statement uh, is that L gamma is the length of the geodesic through anti-desitter that connects those two points on the boundary. So this is some space-like geodesic length that calculates the correlator. Now this geodesic length is infinite, so I'm going to normalize. We could calculate renormalized lengths, or I could just normalize this by the vacuum geodesic length, and then I'll get something finite. So this is calculated by minus delta psi times L gamma minus L gamma vac. Here I've replaced the dimension, I've replaced the mass of the field by the dimension. Uh, so this, so the, usually there's a slightly more complicated relationship between mass and scaling dimension in ADS-CFT, uh, but it, at large mass it just reduces to mass equals dimension. I've set the ADS radius to one. If the geodesic stays very close to the boundary, which it will, so if we're, if we're in the light cone limit, then this geodesic is always going to stay very close to the boundary. And you remember from yesterday that when things stay close to the boundary, you can, you can treat the bulk perturbatively. Because when things st stay close to the boundary, the bulk metric perturbation is suppressed by the distance from distance by the uh, radial direction. Uh, so we can treat this perturbatively. It's approximately one minus delta psi times delta L, where delta L is this geodesic length. Now, this you can calculate very easy, very easily, perturbatively in the bulk. So you just find the, you find the geodesic in empty ADS, and then you vary it to first order. Since it's a geodesic, you don't have to move the geodesic, you just integrate the metric perturbation over the old geodesic. So that takes a couple lines, but I'm going to skip it. And you get u over 2 integral minus u to u du tilde 1 minus u tilde squared over u squared h u u of u tilde at v equals 0 x perp equals zero, and z equals z of u tilde, where z of u tilde is the solution of the vacuum geodesic equation, square root of u squared minus u tilde squared v over u. So I'm working here in our usual light cone limit, uh, v to zero. Okay, does that make sense what I did here? I skipped some steps, but uh, it's a straightforward calculation to, to calculate the first order change in this geodesic length. Yeah, the, the question is whether this is for any state phi, and the answer is yes. Even in a black hole, which is a big deviation from the ADS vacuum, you don't notice that if you stay near the boundary, because if you stay near the boundary, uh, there's a, the, the metric expansion says that uh, the perturbation is suppressed by powers of z, z being the radial direction. So uh, that's what... That's sort of what makes the light cone OPE so powerful, is that, is that even completely non-perturbative things, you can treat perturbatively. 
actually, this is a general this is a general sort of fact about the light cone OPE is that uh, is that it gives you a perturbative parameter where you didn't really have one. Is you, that the approach to the light, like in CFT language, it's the it's the approach to the light cone that gives you a small parameter to expand in. In bulk language, it's the closeness to the boundary that gives you a small parameter to expand in. So even when things are totally strongly coupled and non-perturbative, you still have control. So now, remember the ADS-CFT dictionary uh, in four dimensions, I'll write the constants in four dimensions, but this is general, uh, tells you that, how, that near the boundary, the metric perturbation is related to the stress tensor in the dual CFT. So we could just plug that relationship in here, which says that uh, HUU near the boundary is 4 pi G Newton Z squared times the expectation value of TUU. So if we plug that back into our formula here for the WKB approximation, it becomes delta L equals 2 pi G Newton, V U squared, that V is coming from these factors of, there's just some, a factor of this thing squared changing that formula. So VU squared integral minus U to U, DU tilde, one minus U tilde squared over U squared, squared, times phi TU U phi. That's exactly the formula for the light cone OPE uh, that we derived in the first lecture. Familiar? So if you, you know, we, I, I did this, I calculated this as an expectation value, but we could have been in any state. If something is true in any state, then uh, we can just strip off the, we can just strip off the external operators, uh, the, the phi's here, and just call this, uh, an operator relation, so we get uh, something like psi psi is one plus some constant v u squared integral from minus u to u to u tilde one minus u tilde squared over u squared squared t u u. When we were talking about the when we, when we did the OPE and we kept all the leading twist operators and we added them up and we, used the, we calculated the OPE coefficients and turned that into an integral and so on, this is exactly the answer that we got. So this is the sort of thing that I meant when I said that holography is... Uh, in a way, just cap in, in in a way, just capturing for you the properties of the OPE in the light cone limit. This is not true in general. In general, uh, holography is the dynamics of the theory are important, uh, and I'll come back and say a few words about that later today. Uh, but in the light cone limit, uh, it really is just the OPE. Yeah. I can't hear. Uh, Say it again. I can repeat the question. So the question is, uh, what about the double limit? 
So when we talked about CFT, uh, we, we took a double limit. First we took, first we took V to zero, and we got exactly this formula. Uh, and then we took, so that, that was taking these to be like unseparated, and then we took U to infinity, uh, and we could do the same thing here, and the interpretation is the same. The reason we took U to infinity before was just to turn this into the ANEC operator. But in fact, the relationship uh, is more general. That you don't even have to, you don't have to take the second limit in order for this to agree uh, with CFT. It already works at this stage, and we could, we could now take the double limit if we wanted to. There are lots of other cases where, there's, where these light cone expansions and near boundary expansions are, are very easy to do on the gravity side and, and pretty hard to do on the CFT side. Um, from correlators to, to entanglement to other things. Okay, so now I'm gonna change gears for the last 45 minutes and talk about This coefficient? Uh, this coefficient works out. It, get, it comes out exactly right. So there's a, this G Newton is related to one over CT, and if I had kept all the delta size and CTs, then we would get exactly the same coefficient that we got uh, from the CFT side. Uh, and what was M? Ah, in the in in the uh, in the small mass limit. Good. Um, no, no, it's it, it really is delta psi. So that's what we we saw in the CFT that it was really delta psi. If we wanted to do this uh, at this holographically at small m, we'd have to use Witten diagrams instead of geodesics, and then we would get delta psi again. Uh, no, just from it being not a, just from, from the fact that you can't use geodesics for light fields. So you, you could do the same, the, the same thing that we just did, you could do with a Witten diagram instead of a geodesic, uh, where you just draw a Witten diagram connecting this, a two-point function between these two points. If you use that Witten diagram, then uh, you would end up with exactly this formula with the delta psi in it, not an M. Well, the way to think about it is that uh, these, it would be a, it would be a diagram that looks something like this. That would be the Witten diagram. So there would be a point connecting here to there and here to there, and there would be a, a free graviton point connecting you to whatever it was creating the state in the bulk. So you have to do sort of this stripped Witten diagram. Um, it's, it's, it's a single graviton because it's still true that, that, this, that whatever Witten diagrams you do are still going to be dominated in the light cone limit, so it's still going to be a perturbative Witten diagram calculation. Okay, so I promised three perspectives on these energy conditions. So the last one is quantum information. I think this is really one of the, this is really one of the key uh, reasons for being interested in these energy conditions uh, recently, which is that they connect together uh, the kinds of things that we've been talking about uh, so far with uh, quantum information and the connection between gravity and entanglement. So at this point, I'm going to describe the result of Faulkner, Lee, Parikar, and Wang from a couple years ago. The starting point 
is the relative entropy, which we heard about a little bit from Marina, the relative entropy between uh, two density matrices, rho and sigma, is the trace of rho log rho minus the trace of rho log sigma. If that expression doesn't give you a whole lot of intuition for anything, then let me write it a little bit differently. Uh, this is H sigma in the state rho minus S of rho minus S of sigma, where H sigma is defined as minus log sigma minus S of sigma. Okay, so I've just, I haven't done anything. I've just added and subtracted uh, the entropy of sigma, because this, this expression here is minus S of rho, the, the von Neumann entropy, and then um, the, the trace rho log sigma is this term, and I've just added and subtracted the entanglement entropy of sigma. Uh, but notice that the, the S term here is just a constant, and uh, so H, H is called the modular Hamiltonian. It's just defined uh, by pretending that the density matrix is, is a thermal, just pretending that the density matrix takes the thermal form, uh, but in general doesn't have to have anything to do with the thermal state. Okay, so now that it's written this way, it looks a bit like a free energy, right? This is, a, this is, the, this is the, the energy in the sense of the modular Hamiltonian, and this is, the, this is an entropy term. This minus S of sigma, that's just a constant. So we could, we don't really have to worry about that. We've just, you're, there's freedom in how we define the modular Hamiltonian, uh, and that's just a constant. Okay, so this is sort of like some kind of uh, free energy and obeys some similar properties. It's a measure in information theory that relative entropy is a measure of distinguishability. There's a, there's a, precise statement, although I don't quite remember what it is, it says something along the lines of it, the, the relative entropy tells you how many experiments you have to do to figure out whether you're, to, to tell the difference between sigma and rho. Like if, if somebody hands you a system and you, and you want to know if it's in the state sigma or, or not, uh, then it's how many experiments you have to do to, to decide. It obeys lots of nice things. One that I'll use is monotonicity. MPT. MPT is for monotonicity under partial trace. So this says that for A prime subsystem of A, S of rho A prime sigma A prime is less than or equal to S of rho A sigma A. This is pretty intuitive. So if you have a if if you have a measure measure of distinguishability, uh, it can only get harder to distinguish two states uh, if I show you less of them. Okay, so the less you can see, the harder it is to distinguish them. Um, but it's also just something you can prove mathematically.
now we're going to apply this relation to uh, a generalized Rindler space, which I started drawing before the lecture because I can never draw these pictures properly. So this, this is sometimes called a null cut. Uh, the picture is as follows. So it, in Rindler space, you just take you just take space time and you divide it on a plane. So in this picture, that would be uh, like if, if space was, was this way and time is, is going up, uh, then we would just divide it along this plane here. That would be Rindler space. The generalized Rindler space is like a wiggly, it's like a wiggly Rindler horizon. Uh, so the idea is that you give the Rindler horizon some curvature uh, but, it, the, but the boundary of the, is not just totally arbitrary, the boundary of the Rindler horizon lives on a null surface. So that's what I've drawn here. I've drawn the, this is a, the, the null surface in the U direction. Um, so space goes sort of out this way and, and out that way. Uh, so you pick a curve. Yeah, yeah. Um, these, this, these are traced over A prime and these are traced over A. Yeah. No, they have changed, they have changed. So row A prime, um, that's why, so this is, yeah, let me explain that. So, so A prime, A, so if A is A prime B, we've traced over B, to, so to get, to get from here to here, we've traced each density matrix over B and then, and then recalculated the relative entropy. We've done a partial trace of both of those density matrices. Okay, so, so we picked this, this null cut, which I'm going to call lambda, so I'm going to call this, this curve here is um, at u equals lambda gamma of x perp. So perp is the direction into the board. And then the, this, so once you've picked a curve like this, you've divided space time into two halves, sort of wiggly halves, uh, one of them is over here. So call that region A, and it sort of just curves. Okay, so there's a, you're sort of lifting, I think of it as sort of lifting up the corner of the rug, uh, and then region B is everything else. Okay, so here's region B. The strategy now uh, is to study entanglement or these, these quantum information inequalities as you deform the cut. So, for example, you can, you can start with just ordinary Rindler space where it's completely straight, and then you can ask what happens to all these entanglement uh, quantities when you start pushing the, you start adding some wiggles to that cut. And the first order wiggle is actually going to give the anic. So with this setup, I'm going to choose Sigma, so sigma is called the reference state. Uh, we're, we're measuring how far we are. We're sort of measuring how far we are away from the rest, away from the reference state. So choose the reference state sigma to be the vacuum. 
and rho to be any pure state. Then with our uh, setup here, monotonicity under partial trace says that the derivative with respect to lambda S rho A sigma A negative. So gamma is the shape of the wiggle. Lambda is the size of the wiggle. That's what this picture says. And if we increase lambda, we shrink region A. So if you're used to thinking about entanglement at a fixed time, um, then you're used to, you're used to just drawing a, a plane and choosing region A and B on that plane. But in Lorentz invariant theories, uh, you can just as well, if you have a causal diamond like this, then uh, if this was your original region A, then a, a, a tilted region like this is a subregion of region A. And all the usual entanglement logic applies to that subregion. Uh, the reason, I mean, it's, it's clear that it's a subregion because you can think of region A as being this slice plus this null thing. Okay, so you just, you just deform your time slice until it looks like this, and then you trace out the null piece. Okay, so this is a, this is a very common trick. Uh, in deriving, deriving things in, in relativistic theories using entanglement is to not just think about regions in the sense of space, but regions in the sense of space-time. Yes, that's right, yeah. It really is just a subregion because we could just call, we could just, instead of calling it A, we could call it uh, B A prime and then it's really just a subregion. Okay, so with our conventions here that, that our, our cut is being deformed up that way, uh, the increasing lambda is, is shrinking region A, so that's why that was a less than zero. Similarly, uh, D lambda S of rho B, sigma B, can only increase. So adding these two inequalities together, we have the relation zero is less than d lambda s rho b sigma b minus S of rho A sigma A. I'm just gonna plug in the definition of the relative entropy and reorganize the terms a little bit. So there's the, there's the, the definition is, is over there on the first board. So there's the modular Hamiltonian terms and then there's the entropy terms. So we have HB state row HA in state row. And then we have the entropy terms S of sigma B minus S of rho B minus S of sigma A plus S of rho A. I've just copied that definition uh, onto this board twice. Now, 
uh, we can, the, the entanglement terms all just cancel with each other. Uh, and the reason for that is that w the, the entanglement entropy of a region is the same as the entanglement entropy of its complement because we're working in a pure state. So when you have, you have a balance between the chain, between what's happening to region A and what's happening to region B and all the entanglement terms just cancel. So in detail, like S of sigma A is always equal to S of sigma B, no matter how you do the cut. Okay, so these terms cancel. That was the, that's, in, that's the vacuum term, the reference state, but the same is true in any state, so these terms cancel. So here I've used S of rho A is equal to S of rho A complement in a pure state. So the last thing we need to do is understand these modular Hamiltonians. So we've, we've reduced this inequality to this statement about modular Hamiltonians. Now the statement is gonna be that this is the anech, uh, but that's, that's where we have to get to. So uh, for, I'm gonna just give you the formula for these modular Hamiltonians. Uh, before I do the wiggly cut, I want to remind you the modular Hamiltonian for Rindler space. Which is just one where you set lambda x, lambda gamma equal to zero. Modular Hamiltonian for Rindler, well we know that Rindler space is thermal in the Rindler sense, so it's thermal with respect the so Rindler is thermal at temperature, inverse temperature 2 pi, uh, with respect to the Rindler Hamiltonian, which is the generator of Lorentz boosts. Okay, so if we take, so if we take the log of the Rindler density, the Rindler thermal density matrix, then uh, the modular Hamiltonian HA, just two pi times the boost generator, which is the integral over the perpendicular directions and integral dy from zero to infinity of y t zero zero. This is the generator of boosts. Uh, I've just used the fact that the normal is the time direction, and then we get uh, the, the boost vector is y in the t direction. Using conservation, you can rewrite this. So, The expression that I just wrote, uh, since it's is is integrated over Rindler space like that, it's an integral over the integral over this region. Uh, but using conservation, you can deform this and write it in, as an integral over the Rindler horizon. This this is a conserved current, uh, and by pushing this integral up to the horizon, you can write it as two pi integral dx perp, integral du from zero to infinity, u du u, where now the integral is over this Rindler horizon. So th 
this part has been well known for a very long time. But what's been understood only recently is how to do this for Wiggly, for Wiggly uh, generalized Rindler horizons, so general null cuts. I'll write the answer and then say some things about it. So the answer for a general null cut Oh, and I should, I should say also that this is pretty easy to derive. In modern language, in, in, with modern techniques and thinking about this as a Euclidean path integral, uh, you could derive this in about five minutes. So this is uh, fairly easy. Uh, the, the, for the general null cut, the formula is almost the same. So the formula for HA is two pi times integral dx perp integral du. Uh, so we're going to write it as an integral over the over the future horizon here, which means that u runs from. So it's going to be an integral over over he, over this region. Okay. So the limits of integration are on u are that it, it starts at the wiggly cut and the, and and goes to infinity. So it's from lambda gamma x perp infinity, uh, and then it's just the same expression, but now we have to shift by the starting point, u minus lambda gamma x perp times t u u. That's the whole answer. Okay, so this was uh, first derived, I think, by Aaron Wall in free field theory. Uh, then it was uh, derived in this paper of Faulkner and collaborators for a slightly wiggly, so at first order in the wiggle, uh, and, and they had some reason to conjecture that it might be true in general. And then it was uh, derived in general by Cassini, Teste, and Toroba uh, just last year. So uh, I'm not gonna give the derivation. It would, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to derive this. Um, it, would, it would take a long time. Um, I'll just say that I was really surprised to see this formula. I mean, so, so in general, a modular Hamiltonian does not have to be nice. Remember, the definition of the modular Hamiltonian is that you take any density matrix and you just take the log. There's no reason in general for that to be a nice expression. And um, there, prior to this one, there were maybe two or three known cases where we could actually calculate a modular Hamiltonian. There was Rindler space. You can do a, you can, you can do a little bit better in two dimensions by doing conformal mappings um, or free fields. I think that was, that, those are all the ones I can think of. Oh, a sphere, you can do a, a spherical region in conformal field theory. I think that's it. So this was a new one. In general, modular Hamiltonians could be totally crazy, totally non-local, impossible to even uh, reasonably write down expressions. Uh, but for the null cut, the statement is that there's this uh, very simple looking modular Hamiltonian, which is, is just a, basically a sum of Rindler Hamiltonian, a Rindler modular Hamiltonians along the transverse direction. So there's like, if you just, if you just cut it into transverse planes, you just write down the Rindler Hamiltonian for each of those, and that gives you the right answer. So that can be derived a couple different ways. Uh, I think the, 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 the most direct derivation uh, is that you apply perturbation theory to the, to the density matrix. Uh, uh, you, can, you can think of this deformation perturbatively, so you apply perturbation theory. Uh, you work very hard to calculate the first order term, uh, and then you can 
kind of, you can kind of, you can write down a differential equation that describes the flow uh, as you increase this deformation, and then you can solve that differential equation. Okay, so we're just gonna take this equation and plug it into our inequality there. Uh, if we take the derivative of the modular Hamiltonian, and then uh, we're just gonna look at the first order case, so we're gonna take the derivative, uh, the first order deformation, so we take the derivative and evaluate at zero, then uh, the derivative acts on this equation in two places, it acts on the limit of integration, and it acts on the integrand, but this one does nothing at first order because that will just pick up for you the integrand at the end point, which is zero. Okay, so we can just ignore the action of the derivative here uh, and we easily get the answer, which is two pi, sorry, minus two pi uh, times integral x perp, gamma x perp, integral du from zero to infinity du u. Did I get the sign wrong? I think I got the sign wrong. Okay, I hope that doesn't mess up my NEC, but it works out if you do all the signs correctly. Well, it's, the question is whether I'm going to get the right sign when I do the NEC. Um, I might have... Oh, the minus was right? Yeah. Ah, okay, good. Good, okay, so now uh, this, this integral is from zero to infinity. Okay, so this is what some people call this the half NEC quantity. It's like the, it's the half null energy. You don't integrate over a complete null line. Actually, this thing, uh, you, we, didn't, we didn't actually have to do this thing where we subtracted two terms. We could have just studied a, the modular Hamiltonian of one region, and then we would get an inequality relating this to the entanglement entropy. But since we're talking about the ANEC, I, I subtracted the two sides to get rid of all the entanglement terms, and then if we do the same thing for region B and add these up, uh, we get d lambda hb minus ha is the integral, 2 pi integral dx perp, gamma x perp, times the anec thing, du minus infinity to infinity, du u. We said that monotonicity of relative entropy imposes positivity on this combination. Now this is true for any gamma. If this is, if this is true for any, well, any, any positive gamma, because we were assuming that gamma was going in that direction. So this is true for any positive gamma, then it must be true for the integrand itself. So we get integral du from minus infinity to infinity, du positive, and that's our third and final uh, derivation of the NEG, now from a completely different point of view. This, I think, is the most general of the derivations that we talked about. I didn't have to say anything about whether it was a free theory or an interacting theory. Um, I didn't have to use holography. There may be some assumptions about the continuum limit of entanglement entropy and what, it mean, what exactly it means to split the Hilbert space into regions A and B. I think that uh, it would be nice to understand some of those issues a little bit better, but they're just, I, they're subtleties that I think, I, that I think um, will work out. So I'll, 
Yeah. I think so, although I haven't really thought about it. So I, I think I think the answer is yes, but I could be missing something. Okay, so I'm going to close with just some discussing some things until I run out of time. Okay, so we've talked about, uh, we've sort of used the ENEC to talk about various relationships between correlators, holography, quantum information, and uh, shown how we can do various calculations uh, that relate these. They're sort of tied together by this uh, idea of working on the light cone. Here we were doing correlators on, correlators on the light cone. Here we were doing deformations along the light cone. So this is a limit where we can do lots of calculations and match these things together. There are a few Okay, so there are a few things that I that I didn't really discuss that I just want to mention in the last five minutes um, in words. So one is these have to do with sort of extensions and applications of these ideas. The first is the conformal collider bounds. So this is work of Hoffman and Maldacena from 08. I just want to tell you how these fit in. So this came prior to all the more recent uh, work on the ANEC. Uh, in that work, what they did is they studied conformal field theories, and they just assumed the ANEC. Okay, so, they, so they took, they assumed the ANEC as input. They had some physical arguments for it based on the idea that a calorimeter in a collider should not, should not give you a negative number at the end of the experiment. That was their, their argument for it. But they just assumed that the ANEC was true uh, and used it to constrain OPE coefficients. The way they did that uh, is by studying states like this. Okay, so the ANIC, this is a positive operator, it has to be positive in any state. Now, once you have that fact, you can use it to constrain the data of the theory. You can constrain conformal dimensions, you can constrain OP coefficients. Uh, in particular, uh, so if you're familiar with CFT, then you know that the three-point function of scalar operators is uniquely fixed up to a coefficient. That's almost true for spinning operators. The functional form is completely fixed, uh, but there are, there are different tensor structures that can show up. Uh, so like TTT, for example, in a conformal field theory is completely fixed up to three numbers. People often call NS, NF, and NV. Uh, so these are just the coupling constants. Instead of having one OP coefficient in this three-point function, there are three OP coefficients and those are their names. Uh, so Hoffman and Malasena derived bounds, derived in, used the ENEC to derive inequalities on these coupling constants. And you can do much more elaborate things. You can study uh, more complicated states. Recently, there was a paper by, uh, by uh, 
Cordova, Maldacena, and Teriachi, where they uh, looked at similar effects in superposition states of T and other operators, and they derived some new set of bounds. So that's one application of the ANIC. Second thing that I didn't really get into uh, is the question of large N. So uh, the ANIC is a statement about any conformal field theory, and we derived it using the OPE. We expect that holographic theories, I should say not just large N, but also a large gap, just a way of saying that the, the, the theory has to be so strongly coupled that higher spin particles are lifted up out of the spectrum. Uh, so the ANIC is true in any theory, uh, but we expect special things to happen in holographic theories. Okay, so uh, you might imagine that if we repeated, say, the, the OPE analysis in a holographic theory, or, or not using holography, but just purely from quantum field theory, if we repeated the analysis in theory with large N and a large gap, we might hope to get a stronger bound. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, so the way that works uh, in practice is that, uh, is that now we have a one over N. In our OPE analysis uh, in these lectures, we've been using the light cone limit as a small parameter. But now we don't have to do that anymore. Now we have a one over N as a small parameter, which means that the kinds of things we've been doing, uh, you can redo, but in a, but in a much broader range of, of kinematics. Okay, so you can sort of trade V goes to zero for one over n goes to zero, and then you can apply all the same techniques, and but not even being in the light cone limit. You can apply the same methods in a non-light cone limit. And if you do that, you get a, a stronger set of constraints. Uh, instead of getting the ANIC, instead of getting the ANIC, uh, you get a more elaborate operator uh, obeys a positivity condition. Uh, from the field theory point of view, that operator is, is just very complicated looking and terrible. But from the, if you rephrase it holographically, it's the length operator uh, in ADS. So instead of getting the ANEC, you get a constraint on the emergent length operator. You can use that length operator to derive constraint. So just like Hoffman and Malasena did for TTT here, you can uh, now evaluate things like T length operator T. and impose positivity on things like this. And when you do that, uh, actually something sort of, sort of magical happens, which is that you, do, you don't just get inequalities anymore. It, this looks like an inequality. Uh, but what happens is that you get, uh, you, get upper you get upper constraints on the ends, and you get lower constraints. And then in the large end theory, the two just collapse on top of each other. So, what you, so you get upper bounds and lower bounds. And as you, as you take n bigger, you, you just get, they just are the same. So instead of getting inequalities, uh, you fix, you fix the couplings. They're just set to certain values, up to one remaining coefficient. And the values that you get uh, are exactly as they must be, uh, are exactly the prediction of Einstein gravity.
So the conclusion is that uh, taking this ANEC, so if you, if you take what we've done for the ANEC, and you kind of follow your nose and, and extend it in the natural way to large N theories that you can derive Einstein gravity uh, at the level of the graviton three-point function, the graviton three-point couplings. And this uh, was actually, at least our initial motivation for thinking about these causality constraints was that there was a paper by Kamanho, Edelstein, Maldesen, and Zhebeyev a few years ago that used uh, that, that study the relationship between causality and the graviton three-point function uh, from, from the gravity side and understood that uh, the two were, were closely related. So the idea was to understand that from the CFT. I guess I'll stop there. Okay, thanks.